Hi and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to learn about and share good information and advice around ageing well and looking and feeling good for longer. And today we're taking on the topic of free radicals, a term that's commonly used in marketing where we hear we need to invest in products that fight them. But what even are free radicals? Are they always bad for us? And what does that mean when it comes to choosing skincare and using red light? Because Red light therapy triggers a burst of free radicals and, as we're about to hear, there is a balance to be found in getting the most beneficial amount without going too far. Here to guide us through all this is Bev May Sanderson, science graduate and founder of Maysama Skincare, who's made a personal quest to understand red light and how to harness the power of antioxidants and free radicals. Bev, it is so good to finally meet you in person because I, I feel like we've met before because I've watched you on Claudia Glows and I think Skin Obsessed Mary. Did you talk to Mary? I did, I did. A while yes. back. Yeah, I love those two. Um, and you've always got something interesting to say. So thank you for sparing me the time today. Oh, thank you for having me. I want to start by asking about your background because it's an interesting one. You studied microbiology and virology. Is it virology or is it virology? Virology? I say virology, yes. Virology. <laughs> so how did you go from there to starting your own skincare company? Well, my degree course incorporated cell biology, immunology, biochemistry. So it's pretty broad anyway. But then after my degree, I went off and had a, a sales and marketing career. Mm -hmm. So I came to skincare pretty late. And it was only really because... I had issues with my, well, I still have issues with my own skin. I have rosacea. Mm. I still get flare ups, you know, from time to time, but I'm pretty much managing that well now. But when I hit 50, gosh, <laughs> it was a dreadful state. And Just happened I, to me. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, Claire, you look great. But um, yeah, I just thought I need to learn about skin for myself because. The dermatologist puts you on antibiotics and you think this is not a long term solution. I've got to solve mm. this. And and I love I love reading. I, I still haven't lost that desire to learn, you know. So mm. um, I started learning about skin and skin care. And I, I watched a shed load of YouTubers mm. and somebody mentioned rooibos in skin care. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, I drink rooibos tea um, because it helps to manage my rosacea because it's anti-inflammatory and I thought but nobody's using green rooibos um why is that because we know it's you know more potent as an antioxidant so I thought well that would make a really interesting skincare line but because my background is science I thought well I don't want to do it unless I can put science behind it so my first port of call was contacting the South African rooibos council mm -hmm. they put me in touch with the Nelson Mandela Institute in South Africa and they were using a very special kind of green rooibos. It's a spalathin enriched green rooibos. So a spalathin is just like the main flavonoid in, in rooibos, mm -hmm. which gives it its main antioxidant potential. And it's, it's actually an active pharmaceutical ingredient. So they were already doing research studies with that as a tea beverage. And I said, well, look, we want to look at it to see whether it's a, a true bioactive ingredient for skincare mm -hmm. and so we set up we did a collaboration a research collaboration the results came back from that and they were really compelling so that just spurred me on to launch my brand and the first product of course was the the serum well these are exciting times you know because i i started off sort of looking at skincare and now you know obviously i'm motivated by my age as well but just the whole arena of anti-aging it's just so exciting and some of the things that are being discovered for our skin um you realize the potential obviously it goes it goes much further um because we're we're able to affect cellular health and activity now throughout the body so that's just growing and expanding all the time so amazing time to be involved in this um Today, we want to talk about free radicals, which of course can affect our skin and, and um, cells throughout our body in general. But it's something we hear about um, in skincare marketing all the time, that free radicals are playing havoc with our skin and can damage cells elsewhere too. But what are they? I've never really got my head around what they are, where they come from and what they do. Yes, yeah. No, it's it's really good to get some clarity around that. So mm. free radicals are 
effectively they're unstable molecules that have an unpaired electron. So they basically scavenge the body trying to find another electron pair. And in doing that, they can do damage to cellular components. So they're not, you know, typically they're, they're not good things. No. And they come from, well, biologically, we produce them in the body. This is what a lot of people don't know, that they think that they just come externally. But actually, one of the main sources of free radicals is our own mitochondria, the batteries of our cells. Right. So aerobic respiration from mitochondria produces free radicals. And then, of course, our skin is also bombarded with free radicals from the environment from UV light, from pollution. So we've got those two sources. So it is a real thing. I'm just wondering then, do we produce more free radicals in the body as we age? Because, you know, it seems that as we age, we produce more bad stuff in general. <laughs> we absolutely do. That is so mm. true. It actually accelerates, yes. Yeah. They're usually portrayed as, as negative uh, and something we want to counter at all costs. But is there a helpful side to free radicals too? There is, yes. Mm -hmm. So they're not all bad. I mean, whether they're good or bad depends on their levels. So at low levels, they act as signaling molecules. So they actually can start things like gene transcription. They actually would signal the body to produce more antioxidant enzymes. So that's a good thing. And they're also a very important part of our body's immune system. They help to fight viruses. So at low levels, they're great. They act as signaling molecules. At higher levels, well, at, when they start accumulating and we've got excess free radicals, then that's not a good thing for the body because then we, we enter this, you've probably heard of oxidative stress, condition of oxidative mm -hmm. stress. And the free radicals then can start to do damage to the cell because we said that they're trying to steal that electron. So they, they damage lipids in the cell membrane. They damage proteins and they they damage DNA. So it causes DNA to mutate. So over time, that can do a lot of damage to the cell. And if the cell can't repair itself, then it enters this program of cell suicide called apoptosis. So we, <laughs> they have to do that because we don't want unhealthy cells. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but you know, it's kind of a caretaking process, isn't it? Where the body looks after itself. If that cell is damaged, it then commits suicide. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So, so yes, we, I guess the idea is to uh, try and help balance this if we if we possibly can, um, which which we'll come on to. Um, I mean, we're often told in marketing blurb um, that antioxidants help prevent or um, in some way counter the effects of free radicals. What's the relationship between the two? Well, this is it. Antioxidants fight free radicals and our body has its own inherent antioxidant system. So we've got little small antioxidant molecules. You might have heard of glutathione in the body. Very important molecule. That's an antioxidant. I have now. <laughs> <laughs> you have now. Some of your viewers will know that one. Superoxide dismutase, catalase. They're really important antioxidant enzymes in the body. And superoxide dispatase is in the mitochondria. It's in a really important place where most of the free radicals are, are produced. So we've got antioxidants that are endogenous in the body. Mm -hmm. And then we've got antioxidants from diet, exogenous antioxidants, which are equally important. They supplement what our body does. So those antioxidants then fight the free radicals in our body and hopefully keep everything in balance. If they become overwhelmed, then that's when you get this condition of oxidative stress. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's where all that marketing has come from. There, there is really something solid behind it. Absolutely. Um, I know that you've spent quite a lot of time looking at the benefits of red light therapy. That's something I've, I've talked um, a fair bit about on this channel before. Um, red light is thought to generate free radicals. Is it not? Is, is, is it a helpful or unhelpful thing? It does generate free radicals. And we mentioned before that at low levels, free radicals are beneficial. So I think, you know, before we, well, before I answer that, perhaps I should just explain a little bit about how the body responds to stimuli in general. Mm -hmm. So if you have a little bit of a stimulus above a certain threshold, then you get a positive biological response. A bit more of that stimulus and you get even mm. more of a response. Mm. But then you get to this certain density threshold where beyond that, 
it then starts to have an unfavorable response or inhibit those biological processes. And beyond that, literally, you get inhibition. So if we look at red light, what happens with that? You get this initial burst of free radicals, which is beneficial because it then it triggers the cell to generate more antioxidant enzymes to fight those free radicals, but it also gets other biological systems working. As we know that red light, you know, produces more ATP for us. It helps with um, ATP. cell migration. Sorry, ATP is the cells, um, the cellular energy molecule. Mm -hmm. I don't know, seen triphosphate, but I think ATP is probably the easier yeah. one to work with. Yeah. We hear it a few times. Um, it's just, yeah, yeah. I must explain these terms. Sometimes I take them for granted. But yeah, ATP is mm. the energy molecule that is produced by our mitochondria by aerobic respiration. So our body relies mostly on aerobic respiration. So red light um, produces ATP and then the free radicals as a byproduct, effectively. And then We've got our own body producing more antioxidant enzymes, particularly superoxide dismutase, that then fights the free radicals that are produced by aerobic respiration. But if the red light carries on, you have this prolonged exposure to red light, the free radicals accumulate beyond, beyond a certain level where they're not beneficial. And it then starts to undo the good work of your red light effectively. Mm. So you want to keep it because what happens then is before it was helping the fibroblasts, the cells that produce collagen to proliferate, to grow and reproduce. So they're laying down more collagen, producing and laying down more collagen beyond a certain level. Those free radicals then inhibit the fibroblast proliferation. And that's not great for anti-aging. So no. for anti-aging, for anti-aging, we want to keep the free radicals below a certain level. Keep it within that first part of the curve in that upward trajectory. And well, there comes the big question then, um, because I mean, this is something I've become increasingly aware of and through speaking with experts and so on, um, we know that there's that balance with red light, but we don't know what that balance is. I mean, do you have any sense of, um, you know, what the best way to find that happy medium is so that we're, you know, we're, we are getting some of the benefits without tipping into overuse? It's a really good question, Claire, because it's very difficult because there's so many different parameters. You know, what distance are you sitting from the red light? How long, you know, how powerful is the red light? What's the irradiance of it? So it's very difficult to control all the mm. parameters involved. Um, I mean, the first thing I would say is always stay within the treatment time recommended by the manufacturer of your red light, because yeah. there is data behind, you know, where it's effective. And beyond that, it will be less effective. I wondered, do you use red light? Do you use it personally? Really? Yeah. yeah. How, how yeah. often do you use it? And what were the effects that you saw on your skin? So I use red light probably five times a week. I have a red light panel. I have current body if i'm allowed to mention brands <laughs> and my true red light panel i have a current body um led mask i also have some of the current body goggles i love all of my red light devices and what i typically do is use my panel most days during the working week and because for me it's part of my routine in the morning it's mm -hmm. almost like meditation i love you know just sitting in front of my red light mm -hmm. i would do th six minutes in the morning um if i miss the treatment I tend to use my mask in the evening. Mm -hmm. And then at the weekends, I'm more likely to use my mask. It's not about how frequently you use your red light device. This is where a lot of people get confused. What we're talking about when we talk about prolonged exposure is a single session. How long are you sat in front of that red light for in a single session? Now, free radicals have a very, very, very short shelf life. We're talking milliseconds. So Ooh. milliseconds. So when you are in front of that red light, they will build up if you are in front of the red light continuously. Mm -hmm. You start again tomorrow, you're starting from scratch. So there is absolutely no harm in doing red light every single day. It's mm -hmm. how long you do it for within a single session. That That's is important. so interesting. Um, and it's, it's something that I had begun to arrive at, actually, because... 
I had noticed, for instance, that there was a study, I think one of my viewers flagged it to me, um, where a, an eye condition was treated with red light and they were using it daily. So this viewer was, was sort of raising the, the prospect of this must be okay to use daily because look at this study and this was red light that was used for a period of years on children to treat an eye condition and it d did help. But crucially, they were using it for three minutes at a time, three minutes in the morning, three minutes in the evening. I think it was three minutes. I'll double check that and put it in the description. I'll, I'll link to that study. But it's just from memory. It was something like that period of time. And, and when you're talking about six minutes, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think, though, that where people are at is that they're maybe using it for sort of half an hour at a time or they think, more is more so they're pushing it up to an hour at a time and so less is more in this yeah. instance yeah, yeah it's it's so interesting it's great news isn't it because none of us have <laughs> none of us have half an hour of the day to do a red light treatment so i'd much rather have exactly. three minutes or six minutes yeah, and I get questions all the time. Well, how much, how long should I use it for? And I, I, I think, you know, I don't know. I don't know oh, what the recommendation that is. That seems like a more sensible route. Five days a week, six minutes. You do that a.m. and p.m., did you say? I do my panel in the morning. Yeah. Um, I use my current body mask in the evening if I miss my treatment with the panel right. in the morning. It's just I do it that way because I just love the routine of starting the day with red yeah. light. And the panel, obviously, you know, you're, you're treating a, a bigger area. And what kind of a difference have you seen to you to your own skin? Because you talked about your rosacea. Over what period of time would you say that started to unfold? Well, I guess I've probably had my red light panel now for, I, I feel like it might be two years. I'm not entirely sure when I started, but I did have a red light bulb that I was using prior to that for about a year as well. Um, but it's just helped massively for me firstly with the rosacea um because obviously that's my that's my main issue mm -hmm. um the anti-aging benefits for me are a bonus so um i i know that it has improved the tone and texture of my skin regardless of the rosacea because <laughs> when i had my eyebrows done um not recently but last year the lady said to me the skin on your forehead is incredible for a lady of your age <laughs> and I, I just said, don't you love when they say your age <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. But you know, the, there is a notable difference. It's your skin is is softer, um, slightly more toned. Yeah. But to me, the rosacea was the main element that I wanted to treat, and it has helped really reduce the erythema, the redness in my skin. The difference is incredible from three years ago. That's great. It's just so helpful, actually, because I feel like uh, we've been able to move that conversation around red light therapy on really nicely today to build that understanding behind it and just give people some more insight into what might be the most effective and safe uh, periods to use it for. But there are some strategies we can use as well to help buffer free radicals from red light therapy to really optimize the results for skin rejuvenation. So perhaps we should just touch on those briefly. Mm. First one is pulsed light. A lot of people don't realize that actually if you use pulsed light, it would really help to, to buffer the free radicals because what happens is when the light is on, then it's producing ATP and of course you get the free radicals but when you turn the light off when it's switched off what happens then is the cell uses up its ATP reserve and the free radicals then start to disappear because as I said they've got a really really short shelf life which is why I love I love some of these little handheld devices that people use on the face with red light because yeah. you're not really then on the same area of skin all the time and some of them also have like pulse light Anyway, so if it's on, off, on, off, you don't get the buildup of free radicals. This is something we learned. I, I've had many discussions with Professor Andre Sommer, mm -hmm. who wrote the original paper around um, green tea and LED, a dynamic duo for skin rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. And he taught us about pulse light. And I, I found that fascinating. And in many yeah. medical centers, they use pulse light. Because I've used Pulse Light very successfully for hair removal, and I'm quite often asked on those videos, can I use the hair removal on my face for rejuvenation? Different. Well, that's important to clarify. You're thinking of yeah, intense yeah. Pulse Light. This is not. This is just LED light on and off. So right. all we mean is on and off, on and off. So 
So any, what, what would be the sources of that? What kind of devices are we talking about? Because I've got, I've, for instance, I've got handheld constant red light devices that you can move around. It's already a, a step forward in a way because you're mm -hmm. not constantly on the same area of skin. But if that was flashing on and off, then again, you've got, you know, the ATP building up, free radicals disappearing. Um, yeah. It's just not constant. Yeah. Yeah. And if somebody wanted to um, try the benefits of pulsed light for skin rejuvenation, what kind of device would they be looking for, do you think? A lot of these handheld devices, which have mm -hmm. LED in them, have pulse light. Um, right. You can also simulate pulse light. If you have a panel, then mm -hmm. what you can do is you can do this. Interesting. Then yeah. Yeah. Okay. Learn something new. <laughs> Every single day. <laughs> you can do this too if you want, but you know. Yeah, because it's you don't want to have to keep, you know, buying new this, that, and the next thing until you've got hundreds of devices. But it's just interesting. Um, Andre Summer said to me, take a step back and step forward. I'm like, that's really hard. <laughs> so I just started doing this and I thought, well, that works. You put it on one side of the face. And I actually found it really beneficial because when we stood in front of the panel, sometimes we forget about this bit around here. So it's quite good if yeah. you're doing like this, one side and then the other side. And then you've got the light on, light off. So the second one is to use an anti, a topical antioxidant with your red light. And I mentioned the paper that was released by Andre Summer around green tea and mm -hmm. red light, a powerful duo in skin rejuvenation. And he showed that green tea had the ability to speed up, accelerate the effects of red light therapy. And it's really because the green tea comes in and as an antioxidant, fights out those free radicals and keeps the free radicals below a certain level. So it's a co-treatment and it works really, really well. There's information around other antioxidants as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not just that paper. We can see that resveratrol has an effect on red light therapy. Guarana has an effect, which is a plant from Brazil. Yeah. To the green tea. Um, and of course we have, Mesama has our own mm -hmm. serum, Mesama Green Moibos Press Serum which we claims tested um, because it's not green tea, it's green rooibos tea, a spalatin mm. enriched green rooibos tea. And lots of people picked it up and started using it with a red light. And being with the science background, I wanted to put some science behind that. You know, is, is it working the same way as green tea? How does it work? Um, would we get the same results? So Mito Red Light very kindly donated um, the equipment for us to run these extended product trials and we did some testing over three months. So a panel of 16 women. And we did a split face protocol. So they put the serum on one side of the face, 15 minutes before LED treatment. Then they used the red and near infrared panel for 10 minute treatment. And we measured the results before and after for various skin parameters, including mm -hmm. elasticity, wrinkles, erythema and pigmentation. And, and the results were incredible. So, I mean, for example, um, if you take elasticity, it was showing us using the LED panel alone, 20% improvement in elasticity. With the serum before, 55% mm -hmm. improvement elasticity. And wrinkle reduction, 10% versus 30%. So it was incredible. We were absolutely blown away by the results. And how are you measuring those results? Is that sort of just visually or how, how do you yeah, measure it? It's scientific equipment in the laboratory. It's done by a, a third party regulatory laboratory in Europe. The reports are actually available on Maysama's website, the equipment okay. that they use to do the testing and then verified by a dermatologist as well. And I know that you'd, you'd mentioned um, before that there are there are possible beneficial effects within our body for, for free radicals. It's not it's not all bad. It's not all bad, no, um, but I, I think I was looking at it more in relation to red light because, you know, we know red light from an anti-aging mm. perspective, but actually there are other applications of red light. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that red light produces free radicals and prolonged red light produces a lot of free radicals. Mm -hmm. And that can actually be beneficial in some applications. So mm -hmm. for fibrosis, for example, which is basically an overproduction of collagen, so we end up with a, a scar, mm -hmm. we can use red light to treat fibro uh, fibrosis. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know whether you recall Katie Hill, who was a BBC 
um, uh, sorry, uh, yes. Blue Peter, a Blue Peter presenter. That's right, yeah. Yeah, she had a, a nasty accident in 2019 and she had a, a scar, a four inch scar, horizontal, sorry, vertical scar on her mm. forehead. She treated that with red light. You know, she was oh. told that she would be scarred for life. But mm. by using red light, prolonged exposure to red light, she managed to treat that, which is yeah. amazing. There'll be other examples. So that's one. It's also used to treat viruses. Mm -hmm. uh, I know they've done some work around HSV, so herpes simplex virus, cold mm -hmm. sores, we know it better. Um, so, you know, medication for that might be a acyclovir normally, and then they use red light as an alternative, and it managed to stop the outbreak. It's quite yeah. impressive data yeah. around that. And they've also used it to, to, well, they are looking at it for COVID. So during the pandemic, they used prolonged exposure to red light to fight the coronavirus and mm. certainly proposing that it is you know should be part of a strategy to fight corona so it's, yeah it's they did that in the US didn't they that was where it yeah. was I, yeah I noticed that I've, I've... so free radicals are they good or bad mm -hmm. they're both they're both it depends on the levels and it depends on the application mm. excellent well, we've learned a lot today about both free radicals and red light and, and just trying to get that balance. So thank you for sharing that with us. Very helpful. Thank you, Claire. I hope you enjoyed that interview. I know I found it helpful to get a little more of a steer on a beneficial amount of red light versus what too much red light treatment may look like. Since my conversation with Bev, I've actually been using my own red light mask almost daily, but just for six minutes in the evening after I've done my nighttime routine, Bev mentioned that she uses the current body mask, which is generally seen as one of the best value on the market. So I'll link to it in the description. I have a 15% discount code for that and other current body products. And I'll also include a link and discount code for the Even Skin light mask that I use, as well as Bev's skincare line and a couple of blog posts by Bev for more information on red light and free radicals. Let me know what you thought about today's interview in the comments section and any topics you'd like me to explore with experts on the channel in future. And remember that if you enjoyed the conversation, then by liking this video and podcast, you help it reach more people. You'll find lots more interviews like this one on the channel and there are many more to come. So if you haven't already, I hope you'll consider subscribing. Until next time, thanks for watching and listening.